I'm uh, just thrilled to have two of my colleagues here today, uh, Jessica Reed, the Quality Improvement Manager at Maine Quality Counts, um, who is going to uh, share some of her perspectives in terms of working with practices, and then we're going to go to Chelsea Edwards, our uh, practice facilitator and now project manager. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much. It's nice to be here with all of you today. So Lisa had asked Chelsea and I to give you all just some examples of what we see kind of working with the slides a little bit that she has kind of the, the concepts I should say that she's kind of talked about a little bit and so one of the things that one of the projects that came to mind when I was reading this is a project that I worked on with a pediatric clinic and the, the goal that we worked on together was increasing HPV rates in clinical practice and so within that I think the data and being transparent around the data and then tailoring the education to the staff all really made this very successful. So the important first step for us, of course, was using this data and I actually wrote down something that was on one of Lisa's slides that said, let data speak the truth and point the way. And I think that is so, I'm definitely gonna use that in the future for some of my presentations because I think that that is so very true. And so well, the important first step was IT developing the ability to pull these HPV vaccination rates for not just you know clinic wide but actually all three doses boys and girls and we narrowed down our focus for this project because again again things can get very big very quickly so we want to have those successes and so we decided to focus on 11 to 12 year olds and we also because of that we give um, DTAP and meningococcal at that time that was something we just they decided to pull from their EHR as well and so what, what we did was that data is the QI director shared that data now this is clinic level data uh, with the providers and the clinical staff in staff meetings and in the provider meetings. Again, to really show everybody where they were at, I always find with data that a lot of times where people think they are and where they are are usually two different two different pieces. And so again, getting that buy-in and getting people to say, oh my goodness, I really thought that as a group we were really doing you know, much higher than that. And so then what we did was decided that it's, first of all, just to back up a step, it's also really important to give the data at the beginning of a project. You know, it's, it's really to have all those pieces in place before you roll out a QI project, I would really recommend. Because again, you wanna um, have that appearance of having this information being organized and really having everything in place to roll these, these QI projects out. So what we did next is we decided to tailor education on HPV vaccinations. And a key piece that I learned is that we actually ended up doing three different presentations. So rather than trying to get everybody in there, we did um, one, and again, each presentation that I did was tweaked to the audience that I gave it to. So for the providers, that was really getting into the, the real data, the research, the graphs, you know, really, and for all of them, actually, there was a little touch of all of that. So we did the providers, we did the MA and nurse training and then we also did the PSRs uh, which stands for uh, patient service representative or front desk staff and the reason and I thought this is a great idea is again like Lisa was talking about having them practice and and really to the level of their what they can do and I think really empowering them with knowledge because the PSRs are the people that are calling back the patients to get those vaccination appointments done so really again the why with all this education why are we doing this as an organization and why do we feel this is important so I think that's really important for getting that buy-in and so then you know again one thing about education is in it in regards to HPV you know we were really changing the messaging so really changing it to cancer prevention so looking for ways to add a new focus to the current work you're already doing. You know, trying to kind of generate some excitement around what you're doing, I think is so important. And then sharing the successes, you know, the unexpected ones as well as, you know, all the things that happen along the way. So one of the things that we found in this project is not only did we increase HPV rates, um, dose one, two, and three for boys and girls, but we also had um, an added increase in the meningococcal and DTAP, which makes sense because we were focusing on that as well. So I think that builds a real positive QI culture, you know, in speaking of that and sharing those successes. And then when you're having those successes, they really, I think that helps really, like the big picture Lisa was talking about, really lets them see the vision of QI as a whole and how this work and these concepts in general all kind of come together so I think that's all really important and then real quickly the second um, piece is really to talk real quickly about an, an example 
giving individual data and how that also um, changes the culture. So the example I just gave you was around a clinic-wide, um, you know, the screening rates. And then I also worked on a, a, a colorectal cancer screening project with the six different uh, practices. And we were able, the, one of the focuses that we felt was really important is giving individual when possible. Obviously, we recognize that that is, you know, within the EHR capacity and, and where practices are at. But really, again, pulling the clinic-wide and then also pulling individual provider like Lisa was saying that is really a huge motivator and we found that you know taking that one step further so in our project one of the pieces that we we're working on was providing evidence-based um, tools such as fit testing for patients and so one of the ways that I found that was very effective was actually we started gathering the data um, from when the fit test was given all the way to after the colonoscopy and what was found and then giving that information back to the providers and clinical staff teams. So in other words, we're pulling this data and looking at these things to give them this back on their own patients. And the advantage of that is that it also helped with a lot of things like there's a lot of false positives or there's, you know, so there was multiple reasons why that's important. And really, you know, again, if you're showing this data and it's showing that the majority of the patients they're finding, you know, adenomous polyps, so they're finding other things, you know, again, that increases that buy-in. So I think that's super, super important. And so again, I think, one of the other pieces I'll close with and then I'll hand it to Chelsea is the important that Lisa talked about also is keeping this data and this project and the QI um, project that you're on kind of still like I think it's really important to like really address that at monthly meetings not just quarterly every six months you know QI is something we all do every day right because the goal is to increase the quality of care that we give our patients and that's why we all do this work so really getting that culture you know really has to be something that happens you know on a monthly basis and in as many meetings as possible so thank you thank you and then Chelsea mm -hmm. thank you Good segue. Um, so the teams that I've seen be most successful with quality improvement have really empowered their um, their teams to lead the QI improvements. And some of that starts with designating a QI champion, um, additional training and resources for who that champion is going to be, um, and really letting the teams guide how they want to change their work. Um, the leadership may choose a, a big topic of something around cost and then the team can decide well in which which silo of work would I want to work on that can we work on ER visits can we work on lab testing um, the people doing the work every day are the ones that know where the opportunities are and what's going to fit for them and I think investing in your teams to give them a chance to bring to the table the things that they see that are going on that could be improved um, it's it's getting the information right from the source um, the other piece was um, having the person that's leading your quality improvement meetings not necessarily be the supervisor or the manager um, in one practice we had a referrals um, staff and a medical assistant and they were the ones that led the meetings ran the agendas um, everyone in the team meeting had a specific role of doing minutes so everyone who wasn't present in the room got information about what was decided in that meeting um, so everyone had a say everyone had awareness of what was being discussed and what was decided um, and that really helped everyone feel more comfortable that if they saw an issue that was happening they could bring it to that team and it could be talked about and and you could fix it um, they put quick fix boards, which some of the quick fixes aren't always quick, we found out, but um, everyone, when you're in that moment of, why do we do it this way? Um, those little wins that really kind of bog down your day, if you can get a, a quick solution that saves you five minutes here, six different times throughout the week, that's more time you have to do with something else. And I think having those staff-driven initiatives, as well as the things that come from leadership, um, as the more big ticket items gives it that balance of we're all in this together there I'm heard I'm listened to and I'm given the, the chance to work on what what matters to me and affects my day as well yeah and I just would underscore what a big culture change that could be for some practices you know I, I certainly have been in practices where um, uh, staff front office staff have never really been or, or even clinical staff as well have never really been asked for their opinion or 
involved in mm -hmm. changes. You know, I, I harp on this notion of connecting it to the big vision because they really, they really never have. They really have just been asked to room patients or right. to schedule right. patients. Or, right? so. or another example would be um, you're working on diabetes and hypertension care and the front desk doesn't attend that meeting because they don't do anything with that. Well, the front desk is, is who sees how they come into the, the appointment every day. They know about their transportation. They know that their daughter always sits in the waiting room during the appointment and is there and another team member. So getting the, the perspective of, of everyone that's involved with the whole process, I think you get information you never realized was a factor and you also have them participating in, in how they can affect In a way that makes them feel valued. Yes. Correct. Yeah. So I think we'll um, we get our trusty team all together here. Happy to take questions and encourage people to unmute your phones and jump in or, if you can, or chat. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so hi, uh, this is Kate. I um, am, am managing the Q&A through the chat. So please do write in if you have any questions. We do have a couple that we'll start with. Um, so you had some really great success stories, um, but I think anyone doing this work knows that it's not all always success stories. So can you talk about an example where you had to acknowledge some tough realities, but maintain a, a sense of hope and moving forward or had a, a particularly challenging situation where doing this work was, was, um, was really very difficult? Oh, we never have that. <laughs> <laughs> Nope, can't think of one. Um, I think I think one opportunity. Um, it, it comes back to how you do your quality improvement. Um, we used a PDSA cycle, so Plan, Do, Study, Act, um, and looking at the data once again to bring it back there, um, that shows you your direction and and what worked and what didn't. Um, I think by doing the small tests of change, you can hopefully avoid the amount of, of failure that you experience um, by doing small tests and small, small steps as you go. Um, Have you ever had one that just went really bad? Uh, well, I think if you look at it too broadly, mm -hmm. like you were just saying, I think if you, again, this work that I have found can get very big very quickly. And I think, you know, we, again, people sometimes feel overwhelmed. You know, they have, they're trying to see patients. There's, there's so many aspects, as we all know, to primary care. So I think one of the big things I think, like Chelsea was just saying, is if you start off really big, that's where I've seen problems. That's mm -hmm. where I've seen things really start to get, and people, you can see it on their faces, right? You know, they start to get very overwhelmed. You kind of see them sitting back. You, you, you know, you really want to have everybody be engaged and feel they have a voice. So I agree with Chelsea. I think that's where I've seen the biggest challenges is when they said, okay, you know what, we're going to implement fit testing and we've never done it before and we're going to do it across 11 sites all at the same time. Mm -hmm. You know, and everyone is like, because as we know, each site and, and you know, is really its own culture, right? So even though we may be in the umbrella of, a, of an organization and we have 10 or 12 practices under that umbrella, and, and yes, we all are trying to do things similarly the best that we can, there's, there's unique challenges based on where those practices are, you know, access to care, the rural nature, the population that they're seeing, that there's just so many factors that factor into that. So I would say that would be one of the suggestions. So what I, what we ended up doing with the, the QI director there was starting with one practice and really learning you know kind of what those barriers were and what the challenges were before we and again still did not roll it out to all 11 at the same time and then the next step was two practices you know so but then what we also did is we provided a time for the two practices that were new to talk one-on-one -on -one with the other practice that had started because again talking and providing that peer time together I think is critical because it's amazing when you start talking to each other about the same initiative um, again those best practice things that you can share with each other so that's what I would say Mm. So we've hardly ever had a failure, and when we did, we figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> but you, know, so you learn from your failures. Yeah. I, mean, you know, I think I've had um, different team members that just weren't bought into what you were doing, mm. and no, I'm not going to do it. That's not going to work for me. I, I can't. I don't know how. Those kinds of things. But but we still did have some team members that were willing to push forward, um, and there was a point where we decided to kind of diverge and say okay, we're going to still move forward. We're going to try this. And those providers that kind of held back and, and their clinical staff, 
eventually found their own way to do it. It wasn't the way that Team A had gone about it, but Team B found their own kind of process and, and, and way to make it work. Um, and eventually those things kind of melded together to look a little more streamlined. But I think it's okay to, to let people stand when things aren't going to work for them. But knowing that when they see the results, it may change their perspective. It may not always. I mean, you can't bring the horse to water and make it drink. Is that, <laughs> right, is that right. the analogy? Yes, okay. Yeah, make it drink. Yes, okay. yes. Make it drink. <laughs> Great. Okay. Back to you guys. Yeah, I wonder um, if you have, Lisa, any, th you know, just kind of thinking back to some of the leading change stuff, um, if you have any specific, you know, thoughts or strategies about engaging people who are resistant at a leadership level, because that can really, um, imp you know, that can really impede progress. Um, if some of these uh, folks are trying to work with, with practices that have a lot of resistance, are there any specific strategies other than the ones you've mentioned that you would suggest? Well, I guess, um, you know, going, calling a spade a spade, you know, being able to have a frank conversation and just say, hey, this isn't working, right? Um, and uh, what, asking them for help, right? You really trying to enlist their help. What, what do you think is going on? What's important to you? Um, you know, maybe you, you said you want to do this thing and, you know, but it, it's not, it's not really working. So what, what's, what's going on for you and what do you think is another way to do this? So honesty and um, and calling it out, you know, dancing around it does not work. Absolutely. Someone else was wondering, um, as far as um, change management or um, implementing, you know, QI, um, are there dynamics or differences that you could talk about between larger practices and smaller practices that maybe only have a couple of staff? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Hugely, hugely different. Uh, I'll let you guys chime in. You yeah, work a lot. I was just at a, a small practice yesterday and they had already, they started a, a process. It had been two weeks. They had a small pool of patients that they were working with and we went to follow up and they said, we fixed it all. <laughs> I said, <laughs> what? And they said, no, we went through our list. Now we're ready to go on through, through to the next phase of things. And, and they said, that's kind of sometimes the good thing about being right. small yeah. um, is that the amount of, uh, of change to go through it is smaller. Um, you don't have the same necessarily resources of an extra set of hands necessarily or the warm bodies, but um, there's pros and cons to both sides of it. Mm -hmm. I think with, with big systems, there tends to be more resources around data, um, more quality improvement resources and coaches that are probably already embedded into the system, um, which is a great strength to have. But even a small practice, if, if you invest in de designating that time for QI, whether it's learning the tools, meeting time itself, or doing your tick and tally sheets on paper, you can do the same things that a big, a big practice can do as well. No, I would agree with that. I think there are definitely pros and cons to the size, and I think, but I think that shouldn't be a barrier either way. You know, like she said, I think it's about culture. It's definitely about leadership. You know, I think having the right people on the team, you know, I've seen, again, like Lisa said, said one person is not a QI team. It, well, I shouldn't say that. One person can be the leader of the, the clinical team, um, but it's nice to have, if you have that advantage of having, you know, leadership, administration, clinical, you know, clinical um, coordinator, uh, you know, really someone who trains, again, like you're saying, in some of the large institutions, they have their own coaches or they have people that do the training, you know, for the staff. But at the same time, you know, I think looking at the smaller practices, I think that, you know, all the, it's, it's really the same tools and the same culture, no matter how big you are, how small you are. And it's really getting, you know, that buy-in and getting those small successes that really kind of get everybody on board. So, and I think, you know, I think using what you have and, and really looking at what you have. So in other words, you know, maybe you're, you know, we have practices that are still on paper charts, you know, so, you know, again, we talk about data and that transparency and how it's helpful. Okay, so let's talk about how we're going to do that. Like you just said, they looked at, you know, pulling charts for the last two weeks, or they do a 70 chart sample, or, you know, there's different techniques that you can use to still use data to show what your work and what you're doing. So I think it's really looking at what you have. And that's, I think, a really good point to make is that one of the things that I have found critical 
essential in this work is to take the time, no matter what you're doing, what project you're on, to do a baseline assessment of what you have already. So, you know, whether that's, you know, whatever process you're looking at, because one of the things that I find in Chelsea, you can say this too, is sometimes what someone thinks they're doing or what someone thinks they're doing or they think someone else is doing that work. So it's really, um, it almost it, it almost uncovers those PDSAs of its own because once you start really looking at the work they are, that they're doing and giving them the time to talk about that process, the ideas just kind of seem to start flowing. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, really taking the time to do that baseline assessment on the workflow itself that you're doing already and not doing any assumptions on the work. And again, we talk about multiple practices. And again, we, we talk about, you know, training them all the same, but that doesn't mean they don't kind of tweak that to meet what they need at their practice levels. So learning about what they're doing and providing those individual assessments, I think, is really important. That's great. Someone um, was saying that they really um, like what you guys have said about identifying priorities and really using those to inspire people to move forward on developing quality improvement systems in their practice. What are some suggestions you have? Um, you, you know, you also said in your presentation, there's all kinds of stuff going on in the world, no shortage of activity. So uh, what are some suggestions you have about narrowing down a focus and how people have picked these priorities? Well, you know, I tend to think in big categories. So, you know, is it, and, and really up to the practice to use their data to figure out even within the categories, which one, but you know, is it, is it financial? Is the practice hemorrhaging money? You know, is it primarily a business uh, thing in terms of accounts receivable or unpaid uh, bills or getting their um, claims submitted or um, collecting co-pays? You know, is, is it primarily a financial driver or um, you know, related to changing payment models? Is it a clinical driver? Did they just miss their um, bonus on whatever because their diabetes screening rate, you know, didn't meet the threshold for their system or ACO. Um, is it a, a patient um, experience a priority? Are they losing patients or failing to attract new patients because on the last, you know, mainly have statewide rating of patient experience, their access numbers are terrible or they're getting feedback about their front office staff. You know, I think it's really thinking about some of those big categories, what data do they have to point them in the direction or, and or what is the staff saying? Um, you know, if they're not getting input from their patients, they ought to be doing that. You know, whether it's a formal um, survey using something like um, CAPS or whether it's a, you know, box in the waiting room or whether it's a patient and family advisory council, I think that can really help point the way as well. What do you guys think? And I think early on, Choosing something we always refer to as the low-hanging fruit of what can you fix that's relatively, not necessarily simple, but quick in that you're not going to spend four to six months planning it before you actually implement. Um, you want something that you can try and test and, and get the benefit from pretty quickly um, to increase that buy-in and, and to, for people to see the value of why you do the change, the change management and the quality improvement stuff. Build the confidence that they can do it. Exactly. They can actually make something mm -hmm. better. I mean, asking the staff, what's the biggest pain point in this practice? Mm -hmm. um, and patients. And it, right. Yeah. Whether, whether it's from the patients or their own, um, you know, operating in the practice every day so that the improvement makes their life better, right? Yeah. And what's in it for me? That's great. I think um, all of your examples have really pointed to the fact that there's not really a one-size-fits-all and it's really tailored to the practice, but what would you say about a good size um, or composition for a QI team and, and why would you, you know, identify that as being ideal? It depends. Yeah, that <laughs> does. Small, back to the small practice, right? large practice yes, idea. Yes, absolutely. I mean, at a minimum, I, I would say three, right? Even if it's a small practice, because one is not a team, two is still really hard. I'd say at a minimum three. Yeah. And mm -hmm. if it's larger, I mean, if you have a larger practice, having the, you, you described just a minute ago, some of the key um, members of the team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think, you know, having, again, it depends on your resources that you have, obviously, but I think, again, having all the players at the beginning of the project, whenever you're starting, instead of identifying and saying, oh, you know what, maybe that person should be here, and oh, maybe he should be, you know, I think mm -hmm. it's really important to bring everyone together 
to right in the beginning. And so, you know, really, if you have a QI director, obviously that person will be there, uh, the clinical coordinator. So if we're looking at PDSA cycles working with MAs, you know, we want to have the person that oversees the MAs because not only is her input invaluable, but we can also tailor that education and really look at the needs for those, those MAs and nurses. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that's really important. You know, so the clinical coordinator, the QI director, you know, if you have that person that does training for your staff, we also had people that were in IT to the, some of the meetings. I mean, granted, they're not, you know, it's not, may not be relevant for them to be at all the meetings, but I think if we're going to talk about making changes to the EHR, to have someone at the table that can really talk right. about what that is. And I think, I think the answer may be, what's the right size for that team meeting itself? Mm -hmm. it, I've always operated with very agenda-driven um, meetings where you may not need the providers at every meeting or this, right. we're going to talk about exactly. the EHR, so let's bring the data folks in for this one. Mm -hmm. They don't need to be there every time. Um, there is some, when your group gets too big, it gets hard to make a decision. And, and that's the only drawback for me that I see when you, when you get large. I love having everybody participating and, and aware and, and putting in the, their feedback on what they think should happen. But there is a, a tipping point where you need some resolution for decision making and, and that's the flip side to that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think representation of all the parties that the change affects it, down to the, the frontline staff is absolutely is really important. Yeah. And then I think communicating that to the rest of the staff. So like you were saying, look at the agenda and, and have it be that agenda driven. But I think whatever comes out of that, you know, having a QI point or a bright spot, whatever you want to call it within your staff meeting, within your, your provider meetings, to always have QI on that agenda um, is really important. Because again, just making sure that those decisions that are being made are then, you know, getting input from everybody else. So mm -hmm. absolutely. And I think from your point, Chelsea, about uh, groups that are too big, right? A, mm -hmm. an effective meeting science would say seven, seven mm -hmm. to eight is probably yeah. as big as you want to go. Yep. So. Mm -hmm. Not that you can't bring different people in over time. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Absolutely.